We are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 today, uh, and John's letter, Jesus' letter through John says this, write to the angel of the church in Sardis, the one who has seen the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says, I know your works, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. But if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come against you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy." In the same way, the victor will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Jesus, as we go through this um, yet another difficult and heavy letter today, I pray that you would help us. To have, as you say here, ears to hear what you want us to hear. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We've been asking the question, what is wrong with the church? And we've been answering that question by looking at seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches in the first century. And today's church is Sardis. And Sardis and Laodicea are the only two churches that do not receive any praise. Uh, Smyrna didn't receive any judgment. It was all praise. These two churches, they only receive judgment. They don't receive any praise. The only praise that Sardis gets is from others. They have a reputation of being alive, a vibrant, active, thriving, successful, growing church, a church that in our day would probably be featured in Christianity Today or Time Magazine, and their pastors would be headliners at conferences and have books on the New York Times best-selling list. And yet Jesus says, you are dead. Of, of all the letters that we've looked at, this letter scares me the most. The statement, I know your works, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead, is chilling. It reminds me of when Jesus says in his famous Sermon on the Mount, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Jesus says there will be people who will stand before him someday, personally convinced that they served Jesus and served him spectacularly through prophecy and miracles and exorcisms. But Jesus will say that they are not and never were his followers. He doesn't know them. This is sobering and is essentially what Jesus is saying to Sardis here. You have a reputation of being a spectacular church, a church Jesus must be proud of because look at how blessed they are, but I don't know you. And I wonder how many churches are there like this, far from Jesus even as they think they're close to Jesus. The truly sobering thing is that what Jesus says here. I never knew you, you're dead, this, this would have completely blindsided Sardis. Right? When Sardis got this letter, they would have been shocked to read it. We're dead? Since when? How is that even possible? Do you not see what's going on here? None would be more surprised at the accusations than Sardis herself. We can so often be fooled by metrics and success into thinking everything is good, when it is not. Lots of money, lots of attendees, lots of programs, lots of good press doesn't automatically equal a church faithful to Jesus or a church that Jesus is pleased with. I wonder, after having read this, how many small, 
obscure, underfunded, non-flashy churches Jesus is absolutely thrilled with. But we'll never read anything about them. We'll never read about them in Christianity today, and their pastor will never be listed as a top influential evangelical. I think this is so unbelievably relevant today because we have in our minds an idea of what a good church looks like, but is it Jesus' idea? And what does it matter if the world thinks you're alive if Jesus says that you're dead? The frustrating thing for me with this letter is that Jesus doesn't really go into a whole lot of detail about what exactly makes Sardis dead. I like detail. Jesus has frustrated me here. He's not being very considerate of my need for detail. Right? All he says is, Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. Their, their works are not complete before God, and they've forgotten, neglected, not kept something that they received and heard. That, that's not a lot to go on, so I'm using perhaps a bit some sanctified imagination here today in this sermon, but the language that Jesus uses here is language that he uses elsewhere, and the language of works actually immediately makes me think of John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, for a bit of context, I'll start at verse 7, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says to them, if you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been among you all this time without your knowing me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. I assure you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. Jesus promises his followers that are right in front of him, but every subsequent generation of his followers, Jesus promises them the works that you have seen me do, you are going to do in the world. You are going to become like me, and you are going to live like me. You're going to love like me, you're going to serve like me, you're going to give like me, you're going to extend hospitality like me, you're going to teach like me, you're going to evangelize like me, you're going to break the power of demons in people's lives like me, you're, you're going to become like me, you're going to live like me, you're going to give people a taste through your life of a better God, a better way, a better kingdom, a better life, you're going to be like me. And the works that you've seen me do, you're going to do on a far grander scale because there's going to be more of you. There's more of us in more places, right? Jesus, during his earthly ministry, was just one man in one region of the world, but now the Holy Spirit has come on the church, and we are millions of people spread out all across the globe in every nation state doing the things that Jesus did. What Jesus says to his followers here, to us, is that we are to become like him and live like him and make him known in the world. And these are our works. These are the works that we are meant to be pursuing with our lives. And so when Jesus says, I have not found your works complete before my God, I would suggest he's saying, you've stalled. You've stalled in your discipleship. You, you were teaching people to become like me and live like me, but then you stopped. You decided that you'd gone far enough, you'd done enough, that you didn't need to do anymore. For whatever reason, they stopped growing. They just stalled out and stagnated. They decided, perhaps unconsciously, we are like Jesus enough. We don't have to go all the way. We don't have to become like him in every way. We, we've surrendered enough of our lives to his lordship and formation. We can keep the rest of 
it to ourselves. We don't have to follow him here. This is tragic, and unfortunately, I feel like it's everywhere. We will obey Jesus, but only up to a certain point. Right? For a lot of Christians, we will obey Jesus, but only up to a certain point. We will be zealous for righteousness in certain areas of our life, but then we will be utterly selfish and worldly in other areas of our life. And, and not because of ignorance, that's one thing, or not because you know Jesus is working on us, but we're just not there yet. Like decidedly, no, in this area of my life, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to be like Jesus. We see it at the individual level, but we also see it at the institutional level as well, at the level of the local church, at the level of seminaries, at the level of denominations. We will only go so far in following Jesus. In in liberal circles, we'll talk a lot about ending poverty and justice for the oppressed and environmental stewardship, but we won't talk about sexual ethics and we won't talk about abortion. In conservative circles, we will hammer sexual immorality. But we won't talk about racism, or xenophobia, or misogyny, or greed, or gluttony, or bitterness, or gossip. Or we'll talk about sexual immorality, but only certain kinds of sexual immorality. We'll talk about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, but not about loving our neighbors. Or we'll be very specific about who our neighbors are. It's these people, but it's not these people. It's not the people that vote differently than me. It's not progressives, it's not liberals, it's not conservatives, it's not Muslims, it's not the LGBTQ community, it's not First Nations, it's not addicts, criminals, the unvaccinated. Or we'll talk about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, loving our neighbors, but we won't talk about loving our enemies and not resisting evil with violence. We'll go so far with Jesus, but then no further. This is where I stop. We'll bow, no questions asked, to some commandments, but then we'll explain away others. Oh, that's cultural. This is 2,000 years later. Uh, It's a very different world. Or we'll say that's for a different dispensation. That's one of my personal favorites, right? Uh, We used to go to a dispensational church. The Sermon on the Mount was kingdom teaching for the Jewish people, but the Jewish people rejected Jesus and the kingdom, so the kingdom's on the back burner. This is the church age. Therefore, the Sermon on the Mount is not for the church. It's for the future kingdom. It's not for the... Like, what? (laughs) Or it can't mean that. I've actually heard that before. Whatever this verse means, it doesn't mean this. It can't mean that. And it's like, wait, hang on. I think it does mean that. Or we'll say these are exceptional times. Yes, most of the time this commandment applies, but now we're in a special circumstance, a special scenario. This is different. And so we will just press pause on Jesus' command, get through this special circumstance, and then we'll get back to Jesus. And we've seen a lot of that over the last couple of years. Or we will, like the Pharisees, qualify every command until it is palpable and sterile. Love my neighbor, yes, but who is my neighbor? Love my enemy, yes, but who is my enemy? We will define everything ad nauseum until the command has lost most of its power. Here's the thing. If you stall in following Jesus, it is because there is something else that is vying for lordship of your life. Some ideology, some desire, some narrative, either a cultural narrative or a narrative given to you by your parents, a narrative you've developed as a result of your experiences. You're seeing the world more through the lens of the narrative than Jesus. Or there's some other gospel at the center of your life. Something else is vying for lordship of your life, but it isn't Jesus. And if you don't deal with it, whatever it is, it will rule you, even as you espouse Christian stuff. So you'll talk a lot of Christian stuff, but your life is being ruled by something else entirely. Sardis looked good, it sounded good, 
but Jesus wasn't at the center anymore. They weren't obeying him because something else was ruling them. They had stopped becoming like Jesus even as they preached him. They stopped becoming like Jesus even as they preached him. They had a vision, a mission, attractive leaders, a massive budget, dynamic preaching, emotional worship, high production values, large attendance, lots of engaging programs, maybe. All of the elements of a church were there, but they'd lost the heartbeat of it all. They'd lost the why, they'd lost the raison d'etre, they'd lost the center, Jesus himself. Jesus warns in Matthew 25, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Jesus makes a promise here. The more we lean into Jesus, the more we follow Jesus, the more we want of Jesus and hunger for Jesus and thirst for Jesus, the more he will give us of himself the more he will give us of his love and his grace, the more he will invite us into. But this means that the opposite of that is also true. The less we lean into Jesus, the less we hunger and thirst and desire and pursue, the less we get of Jesus, the less we're invited into, the more we drift from him, our love grows cold. Sardis stopped hungering for more. They stopped pursuing more. And they weren't, according to what Jesus says in Matthew 25, they weren't just stagnating, but they were declining. They were losing even what they had of Jesus. Jesus says next in verse 3, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. They had forgotten what they had received and heard. Well, what is that referring to? I believe it's the gospel. And it makes sense to me, right? The, the less you hunger for Jesus, the less you pursue Jesus, the less Jesus is at the center of your life and something else is ruling instead, the less you depend on Jesus and need Jesus, the less often you are going to think of the gospel or think to communicate it to others because the gospel is the message of Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, then you don't have his message. And you start to replace it with other things to motivate yourself and to motivate others. You start to bring in other messages and other tactics. And sadly, too many churches today do not preach the gospel. They don't preach good news. I think one church not preaching the gospel is too many. So I think it's safe to say too many churches today don't preach the good news of Jesus anymore. And without the good news of Jesus, there is no power because the gospel, the good news of Jesus, crucified, buried, resurrected for our sins that we might be forgiven and made right with God and be made new and everything might be made new, right? Without that message, there's no power. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel saves, the gospel changes hearts, the gospel transforms, the gospel renews cultures, the gospel sung, prayed, read, taught, preached, celebrated, and believed. We need the incarnate Son of God, God become human, sinless, crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended. We need that Christ put before us every single week. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, without the gospel, we're lost. For there to be good news, there has to also be bad news. There's a God in heaven that we have rebelled against. We've rejected his love, rejected his goodness, and we have become disconnected from him. And as a result, we are spiritually bankrupt before that holy and righteous God. We are lost to him, and there is no way that we can make our way back. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves, to right that relationship, to become reconnected to God. And we are destined for eternal disconnection from God. That's what hell is, disconnection from the one that is joy and love and peace and grace and mercy and goodness and all of those wonderful things. 
means we've disconnected ourselves from him and we are destined to be disconnected from him for forever. And that's why we are wrecked and the world is wrecked. That's why we use and abuse people. That's why we hurt people and people hurt us and we hurt the creation. Why everything is broken and there's so much sadness because we've disconnected ourselves from God. And before God, we are under judgment, and there's nothing that we can do to repair or fix ourselves. We need Jesus. We need Jesus to come and rescue and deliver us and reunite us to God and forgive us and make us new. And that's what he did by dying on the cross, by resurrecting from the dead, by ascending to heaven. We need Jesus. And so I can stand up here and I can tell you 12 steps to a great marriage or five steps to success in your job. I can give you lots of great advice, but at the end of the day, without the gospel, it doesn't matter. You are still bankrupt before God and lost. We need the gospel. We as Christians need the gospel in order to actually become like and live like Jesus. It is the gospel that motivates us. Right? We're not earning our way to God. God already loves us and so we seek to live a life that pleases Him because we know His love and we love Him and we want to please Him. The gospel motivates us. The gospel comforts us when I fail in living for God because I will fail in living for God. There's forgiveness for all of it. There's grace for all of it. God is still a loving Heavenly Father and His love is unfailing and unwavering because of Jesus. I can always come home. There's comfort. The gospel the gospel humbles us. Jesus had to be ravaged to the point of dying on a cross for me to be saved. I can't make myself like Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus. I need community to become like Jesus and live like Jesus. It humbles us, but it also emboldens us. We actually can become like Jesus because we have the Holy Spirit and we're united to God and we have each other. And we're no longer slaves to shame and guilt and fear and hell and the devil and sin. We're free. The gospel gives us all of that. And it is the gospel that informs and shapes our obedience. We love our enemies because we were God's enemies, but he loved us. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We are patient because God has been endlessly patient with us. We extend grace because God relentlessly extends us grace. We serve the poor because God saw us spiritually impoverished and gave of his riches to make us new. We love because he first loved us. The, the gospel isn't just a message you need to get saved and then you can leave it behind. It informs and shapes everything. Everything we do must proceed from, be grounded in, and be related to the gospel. And if not, if we're not preaching the gospel, even to believers, then we are just giving people religious moralism, which results in people striving to measure up and be enough and be good enough. And it just leads to self-righteousness when you're doing well and despair when you're not. It leads to drivenness and no joy. Without the gospel, we have nothing. We have no power. And so Sardis had lost Jesus at the center and therefore had also lost the gospel at the center. And therefore they had lost their power to actually make any kind of a real difference in the world. They were just doing everything that the world was doing, spiritualized, but offering nothing different or unique. Jesus exhorts them, be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. Sardis was obviously a church that at one time was pursuing Jesus because Jesus here says something remains. There's something still there. There, there are seeds of something still there. So strengthen them. And remember, remember the gospel you received and heard. Not just you took in with your ears, but the gospel that you believed and embraced and celebrated and centered your life and the church on. Do that again. Get back to that. Keep to it. Repent of your negligence. Rebelieve, re-embrace, re-celebrate, re-center. So strengthen and remember, what does this look like? Well, for strengthen, and Jesus is saying, you were becoming and living like Jesus, and you were making him known. 
Remember that. Remember those days. Remember when you were doing those things and how beautiful that was, even as it was hard. Long for those days again. Yearn for those days again and for even better days. Hunger for more. Hunger for all that Jesus has for you. And whatever it is that is ruling you instead, take it captive. Right? Paul says, take your thoughts captive. And it's like, what does that mean? I, I think it means everything you think, everything you feel, you need to constantly be presenting it to Jesus. Is this from you? Is this what's real? Is this what's true? And if it's not from him, you discard it. If it's from him, you keep it, you lean into it, you live for it. So what is ruling you? Present it to Jesus. What's from you? What's not? What is of Jesus? Keep it. And what is not of Jesus? Throw it away. Take captive what is ruling you. Hunger for more and preach the whole counsel of God again. Teach everything that Jesus commands, even or especially the stuff that is uncomfortable, difficult, culturally offensive, personally offensive, controversial, risky. Teach it all. Explain away nothing. Qualify nothing. For to everyone who has more, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. It makes me think of Paul's final, at least that we're aware of, Paul's final written words to Timothy. He says, as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which is able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus who is going to judge the living and the dead and because of his appearing in his kingdom, proclaim the message. Persist in it whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers from themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, be serious about everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Get back to what you had before. Strengthen it, hunger for more, take captive what's ruling you instead, preach the whole counsel of God, and start preaching the gospel again. Get back to the gospel, make that your hope, ground everything in that, anchor everything in that. Don't look elsewhere for salvation or hope, get back to the gospel. Strengthen, remember, keep, repent. And Jesus says, if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come against you. Jesus uses this language elsewhere with regards to his second coming, but here I think he's talking about a, an isolated action of judgment against Sardis. I don't know whether it will be an actual judgment or just a withdrawing of blessing and provision until the church becomes irrelevant and dies out. I don't know. But as always, Jesus is saying here, God is not mocked. Jesus is going to act against those that put themselves against him. As I've been thinking about all of this, I, I, I fear that too many churches, too many churches have done what Sardis did. They've centered their church on something else other than Jesus. They've centered it on wealth, the American dream, Fame, celebrity, empire, politics, ideologies, power, culture wars, nationalism, relevancy, a, a desire to be accepted and to belong in the wider culture. They've centered it on comfort. And as a result, they've stopped becoming and living like Jesus. They've stalled in their discipleship and obedience because I can't go all the way with Jesus. Because to go all the way with Jesus means to go against this thing that I've centered my life on instead. And so they've stopped pursuing Jesus. And they've disregarded the gospel. 
and to keep their churches going, to keep everything running and keep people serving and giving. They've settled for gimmicks, entertainment, emotionalism, vague, inoffensive, subjective spirituality, relativity, consumerism, and spiritualized versions of the culture's messages, right? Follow your heart. Do what makes you happy. Look inside of yourself. Be true to yourself. They preach motivational speeches, political rants, moral lectures, cultural commentaries, and self-help advice with some biblical content often taken out of context, sprinkled in all over the place, but no gospel. You might say, hang on, David, to teach the Bible, you do sometimes need to talk about culture. You do sometimes need to talk about politics. You do sometimes need to talk about morality. Yes, absolutely, 100%, but everything has to come back to the gospel. Right? Everything has to be grounded in and related to the gospel, not just the messages of the culture, Jesusified. Everything's got to come back to the gospel, and the goal of everything has to be our Christ-likeness and making Jesus known. So often that isn't our goal. In his famous book, Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers, sociologist Christian Smith discovered that most young people who identify as Christian believe in what he calls moralistic therapeutic deism. He says it's a collection of beliefs. And those beliefs are God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible, but also most other world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in our lives except when he's needed to resolve a problem. And at the end of the day, good people are the ones that go to heaven when they die. This is what most young people believe Christianity is. God is there if I need my problem solved. Life is about me being happy and being myself and good people. It doesn't really matter what they believe, end up in heaven. Like a lot of young people are like, this is Christianity. And they've come to those conclusions because they go to churches where there's no gospel. It's just the motivational speeches. It's just the message of the culture with some verses tacked on. These churches, churches that do this, they might be successful, rich, well thought of, well attended, productive, busy, excellent in every way, but Jesus says they're dead. There's no power. And then Jesus says in verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the victor will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I love that. There's a few people in Sardis who haven't defiled their clothes. They haven't given themselves over to all of this stuff. I want to be like the few people in Sardis. I want us to be like the few people in Sardis. I don't ever want us to be a church that has anything at the center other than Jesus. I don't want any other ideology or narrative or false gospel or desire at the center of our church. I want Jesus at the center of our church always. I don't ever want us to be a church that draws a line in our obedience, that teaches only the commands that mesh with our sensibilities, or a church that explains away or qualifies Jesus' harder, more uncomfortable commands. I don't ever want us to stop hungering, pursuing, desiring to enter into more. I want us to surrender all and become and live like Jesus in every way and make him known in our world no matter what the cost. Now here's the thing, our works will always come up short until we see Jesus face to face. But there's a difference between not getting there because we're limited and imperfect and Jesus is still working on us. There's a difference between that and not getting there because at some point we decided no further. 
because we let something else rule us other than King Jesus. And I don't ever want us to be a church that loses the gospel. Sometimes I get to the gospel and I see glazed looks come over some of your faces. Like, oh, this again. And I love that. Well, I don't love that that's your reaction, but I love that apparently the gospel comes out so much that it's like, here we go again. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> We're going there. All right? I don't ever want us to lose the gospel. I don't want us to ever be motivated, informed, shaped by, grounded in anything else. I want everything to always come back to the gospel because that's where our power is. That's where the power is. What's the point? What's the point of all of this with no gospel? Just get together, sing a couple of songs, listen to a nice feel-good message, eat some food, go home. It's just a social club. Church is a lousy hobby. It's a lousy hobby. What's, what's the point? What's the point without the gospel? If we do this, if we forget the gospel, if we aren't centered on Jesus, it doesn't matter how alive we look to the other churches of Ottawa, to the watching world, Jesus says we're dead. May this never be us. May we always be checking that this is never ever us. May we be humble enough to do that. Interestingly, Jesus says the reward for those who keep him and his gospel at the center, the reward is quite simply that you will see the gospel fulfilled. You'll see everything promised, realized. Jesus says we will see God dressed not in our own clothes, stained with our greed and our selfishness and our lust and all the nasty things we say to each other and do to each other, big and small. We won't see God dressed in those clothes, but rather we will see God dressed in the clothes of Jesus' perfection applied to us. Jesus takes our sins and our record of wrongs away and gives us his righteousness. I love what Paul says, I, I don't stand before God in the righteousness of the law, which is no righteousness at all, but I stand before him in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I look blameless, unblemished, perfect, not because of myself, but because of Jesus and what he did on my behalf. We will see God dressed in Jesus' clothes, and we will see our names, Jesus says, unerasably written in the book of life, the book of those who belong to God and will live with him for forever. Once your name is in that book, it's going nowhere. Once you're a child of God, that can't be undone. I love what Paul says in Romans 8, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword know in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us? For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus says, you keep me in the gospel central, you will see the gospel fulfilled. You will see all of your hopes and your dreams realized, everything promised come true. In other words, Jesus is worth it. And I know I say this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> Jesus is worth it. He is worth keeping at the center of your life, at the center of our church's life, over anything that the world has to offer. He is worth obeying all the way with your whole life, with every aspect of your life. He is worth it. He is worth pursuing and desiring more of because there is always more of him to have and he just keeps filling you up. He's worth it. Why is he worth it? Because he alone can actually save us. He alone can change us from the inside out, change our hearts, make us new. He alone can satisfy our deepest longings and yearnings. He alone can satisfy our hunger and quench our thirst. He alone. Nobody else, nothing else. Everything else just points to him, but he's the ultimate. We don't deserve him. We don't deserve his clothes of righteousness. We don't deserve our names written 
in God's book for forever as his children. We don't deserve any of that. We rebelled against God. We wrecked that. We broke that. We don't deserve anything good. We deserve death. We deserve hell. That's what we deserve. But Jesus loved us. God loved us. The Holy Spirit loved us. And Jesus sacrificed himself. He died on a cross and rose from the dead so that we might enter into everything that he has for us. Even though we don't deserve it. He gives it all to us graciously and freely because of love for God so loved the world loved you loved me that he gave his only son there is nothing and no one better than Jesus there is no other gospel than the gospel of Jesus there is no other hope for the world and so may we never like Sardis lose Jesus at the center lose the gospel May everything always and forever be for as long as God allows Southeast City Church to continue. May it always be about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion together now, which seems apropos. Um, Communion is our chance to remember Jesus and who he is and what he's done. Um, If you are a follower of Jesus, if you've entrusted yourself to him as Lord and Savior, King of your life, then you are welcome to take communion with us, even if you're not part of Southeast City Church. If you need your elements, they're at the back table there. What we want to do with communion today is quite simply, like I was saying earlier, I want to put before you Jesus Christ. I want to put before you the Son of God, incarnate, sinless, crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, reigning. I want to put Jesus and the gospel before you. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul says, In us taking communion together, we are declaring to a watching world that Jesus is our everything. The gospel is our everything. All of our hope is in Jesus died and resurrected, and the gospel is sufficient. The gospel is enough. We need nothing else. That's what we're proclaiming by taking this together today. So let's do that. This bread symbolizes Jesus' body broken for us, that we might be forgiven and live with God forever. Let's take this in remembrance of him. And this juice symbolizes Jesus' blood shed for us that we might be cleansed of our sins and be made new. Let's take this in remembrance of him. I'll give you a couple of moments to do whatever you feel you need to next. We've got some prayers up here that might guide you as well in what you want to do next. And after a few moments, I'll invite Andrew and Georgina to lead us in our last song.